All right, let's take our Bibles and let's open to Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15 today. The title of our message this morning is The Greatest Forgive. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we honor you and thank you for your word because we know that you, you bless us with your word. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would lift those words from these pages. And by your Holy Spirit, write them on our heart. Because we know that by your word, you transform. You change us, you mold us, you shape us. Lord, you make us like yourself, your heart, your desire. So we pray that this would be a time of being changed and transformed. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said. We're going to begin in verse 15, but really the conversation began in verse 1. This was when the disciples came to Jesus with the question, and this question was something they had been debating amongst themselves. In fact, the other gospel tells us that they were having a heated argument about it. And the question was, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, that's an interesting question, because when you you look at it, it almost sounds kind of childish. Are you kidding me? They have this conversation, really? I mean, and the conversation had to go something like, hey, you're not the greatest, I am. I mean, you know, doesn't that sound a little childish? You're not the greatest, I am. Until you realize that they were believing, of course, that there was going to be a temporal kingdom with power, and they were vying for position in that temporal kingdom of power. Now, they misunderstood, didn't they? And so they came to Jesus and they said, now you, you help us work this out. Uh, who then do you say is the greatest in the kingdom? And I'm convinced that they were expecting Jesus to point one of them out. But Jesus surprised them. Because he took one of the children that was there in the crowd, called the child to himself. He said, come here. The child came up to him and he put his arm around, arms around the, the child. And he said, unless you become like this little child, you cannot even enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he says, whoever will humble himself as this child, he is the greatest. You want to know who the greatest is? Let me tell you. The one who will humble himself and become like this child. See, Jesus was specifically pointing out a couple of things. One, of course, the value that God sees in a child. Now that's important because... In that culture and society, a child was considered least. And so he's pointing out something important, but he emphasized the humility of the child. That same heart that God desires for everyone who follows him. Do you want to be great in the kingdom? Then have this heart, you see. But we do need to define humility because I think many people do not have a correct understanding of what humility is. Many people uh, define humility as thinking less of themselves. Well, that's not humility. I don't see that in the Bible at all, thinking less of oneself. It is thinking of oneself less. And in fact, the Scripture tells us, Philippians chapter 2, that it's considering others as more important than yourself, which is a very powerful point. He's speaking here of the value. Now, this is very personal for us because... It has everything to do with who we are and the relationships that we have because of the value that God places on those that are around us and on us ourselves. You see, a child is considered of little value in that culture. But Jesus spoke of the value of that child and said even to the point, he said, whoever should cause one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for that person If he had a millstone tied around his neck and be drowned into the sea, that seems a little strong, but see, Jesus is making the point, the value. Now, what's interesting, Jesus does not correct them for desiring greatness. That doesn't seem to be the correction. But he wants them to let go of the world's idea. The world's idea of desiring to be great is to desire to be greater than others. You know what I'm saying. To prove yourself more right, more powerful, 
more high, higher, lifted up over others so that others look up to you. And, you know, and that you uh, are more right than other people. And that's really where I think we kind of see that same thing in our lives. You know, who's the greater? And, and it comes in our relationships. You know, who's more right? I'm more right. Well, you're not right. I was right. I was right before you were right. And I'm more right than you are right. And there is a who's the greatest here sort of thing that comes in. So these are very important for us to understand. He's not correcting them for the desire of greatness. No, he wants them rather to become great in the eyes of God, which means to walk on higher places. Now see, God's ways are higher than our ways. I want you to walk by God's ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I want you to have God's thoughts. He's wanting to transform us. That's what we see in the Scripture. He's wanting to change us, to walk on higher places. And in order to do that, we need to value others as God values them. That's what we see. The relationship, you see. Notice what it says in verse 11. Just kind of back up there for a few moments. He says, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. This is in the same context of who's the greatest. He's continuing with the conversation. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's what you see. Now, see, these, these words are so powerful for us. To save that which was lost, the value of those around you, to build up, to edify, to restore relationship, to forgive those that God is asking you to forgive. These words are so powerful because they're so personal, man. I'll tell you what, if we would receive these words... If we would apply these words, if we would live these words, we would have increased in greatness in the eyes of God. And that's what we should desire. And we would receive a tremendous blessing. Hey, anyone who understands restoration, forgiveness, and reconciliation is going to receive a great blessing. Is he not? And so here's what we see, beginning in verse 15. He's getting very practical here. And he says to us, now this is still continuing on with that conversation, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest is he who will humble himself as this child. And now he begins to give a very practical outworking of it in regards to our relationships. And he gives us interesting things. He says in verse 15, now if your brother sins, and literally it's if your brother sins against you, Go and reprove him or speak to him in private. And if he listens to him, you have won your brother. And the emphasis that I would like us to understand is the point that Jesus is making. Win your brother. And, and, and I see, of course, the whole point is, you know, hey, the whole theme is restore your relationships. Restore your brother or your sister. You get my, he's saying this in, in that form of relationships. Restore. That's the whole point. Restore, rebuild, reconcile, because you value. You know, how, you know how the world is. The world is such that, hey, you offended me. That's it, pal. You're out of here. And we have a tendency to write people off and just X them out. God is saying, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want you to be great in the eyes of God. I value. What you might call the least, No. I value. And I want you to restore and reconcile and rebuild. And then when you see in verse 15 that emphasis on win your brother, there's where we get the point, right? Win the person, not the argument. Win the person, not the argument. I remember when Jody and I were just starting out in ministry that we developed a friendship with this pastor and his wife that were older and, and uh, we really looked up to them and respected them and and uh, they were just a tremendous uh, uh, mentoring couple for us. And remember my wife met with uh, his wife for lunch. And one day my wife said, so tell me how you handle your arguments. And uh, the pastor's wife said, well, we don't have arguments. Really? How does that work? I mean, how is that possible? And she said, well, we do have disagreements. Of course we have disagreements. But we have both decided that this relationship is mar far more important than being right. Now, I like that. 
That is a great way of understanding it, that the relationship is far more valuable than being right. I love what Jesus is saying here. Win your brother over. And he tells us here, the idea here is if your brother sins against you, go and speak to him in private. In other words, if someone has offended you, you go. You have the responsibility to go to that brother in the effort of restoring and reconciling. The goal, of course, is winning your brother or your sister in reconciliation, not to prove that you are more right than they are. Because if you're trying to prove that you're more right, then aren't you trying to say, hey, I'm greater than you are? Who's greater here? I'm greater here because I'm more right than you are, and I'm going to prove it, pal. Well, wait a minute, is that what Jesus said? The one who has humility in his heart will learn how to reconcile his brother. See, it's an opportunity, isn't it, for that person to make it right, to open the door. It's an opportunity for you to make it clear that you value the relationship. God does. I value this relationship. And, 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 and my heart is for reconciliation and restoration. How about you? See, isn't that the point of becoming the greatest? You want to become great in the eyes of the Lord? Isn't that a demonstration of it? I think it is. And in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, the Lord's bondservant, that means the one who serves the Lord because he wants to, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. If a man says, I love God, or a woman says, I love love God, want to honor God in my life, then he says a word. Then don't be quarrelsome. Be kind to all. Able to teach others. Patient when wronged. I love that. In other words, not, not taking offense easily. Wouldn't that be great to have a reputation like that? Uh, he, he doesn't take offense easily. Or she. She doesn't take offense easily. There's something strong there. Wouldn't that be marvelous to be said? Patient when wrong. I love this. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Go into that person privately. That's what Jesus said. Go to him in private. That means you, you don't go to others. Jesus is looking out for relationships, isn't he? Going to that person privately and giving the opportunity for reconciliation means that you don't become a talebearer and tell other people, do you know what so-and-so did to me? You're not going to believe this despicable thing. And so that becomes a talebearer that God says, no, don't be like that. He's speaking again of greatness. Greatness in the eyes of God. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13. He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. I like, wouldn't you love to be trustworthy in the eyes of God? Wouldn't you love for God to look at you and say, now here's someone who's trustworthy. Ah, he's someone who's trustworthy, conceals a matter. Now, going back to Matthew 18, notice what, what he says next. Verse 16, if he doesn't listen to you, if that, if that was unsuccessful, then take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed or the truth may be known. Now here again is the point of let the truth be known, speaking the truth. But one of the things that we see in the scripture is speak the truth in love. The truth must be established. It's important for the reconciliation, the help, responsible you know, accountability. But speak the truth in love. And the whole point again is how to win your brother. How to win your sister. How to have reconciliation and restoration. That's the whole point. If your brother sins and the other person disagrees that he or she has fault, then find one or two to go also that are mature in the Lord. Not that they've just taken your case and your side wholeheartedly so that now you've got two or three more like you're a gang now ready to prove how right you are. Find two or one or two who are mature and godly, not tail bearers, to help restore. It's an opportunity for the truth to be established on both sides. You know why? This is an important scripture. Proverbs 18, 17. The first to plead his case seems right. 
That is, until another comes and examines him. If one person presents his side, it always seems the right side. Have you ever noticed this? I mean, aren't you glad that in our court system both sides get to be presented? Because who knows, maybe you're wrong. We don't often think, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor. That is impossible. <laughs> of course I'm right. I'm always right. <laughs> Isn't that the way we think? What do you mean that you're introducing the possibility that I could be wrong? I, I don't think so. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you're wrong. You see, I love what he said. So that the fact may be established. It's a great word, isn't it? Maybe you're seeing it the wrong way. Maybe you're seeing it the right way. But others who are godly and mature can help establish the truth in love. See, Ephesians 4.15 gives us that directive. But speaking the truth in love. Truth all by itself is quite harsh. Aren't you glad God doesn't speak the truth to us without also speaking it in love? Ooh, we should. We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. You know, many times I have been asked to help to reconcile you know, to be one of those two that goes and, and tries to bring reconciliation. But I always ask this question. Say, hey, would you help me? And I said, this is always my question. Is your heart to restore and to reconcile? Because if your heart is to restore and reconcile, I'm all in. But if your heart is just to prove how right you are, I'm out. Amen. That's what we see in the Scripture. Now notice what we see next. So then Jesus says, verse 17, and then if he refuses to listen to them, see there's another, let's go even to another step, tell it to the church. And so here's what Jesus says, finally the next step is take it to the church. And then if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer, or a heathen as a tax gatherer. In other words, he gives us an interesting statement here of great power. Now, when he says, tell it to the church, I think we should establish what he's not saying. When he says, tell it to the church, he says, he's not saying, okay, I'm going to tell everybody in the church, and I'm going to throw this person under the bus, and that's going to get even to them. He's not saying that. Can we all agree? That's not what he's saying at all. You see, when someone is thrown under the bus, the attempt is to condemn them in the court of public opinion. The problem with the court of public opinion is that they don't have all the facts. And if they don't have all the information, they don't make very good judges. And instead of resolving the matter, what you've actually done is make the matter much worse. Amen? Amen? The idea here that Jesus is speaking to is that there is an authority given to the elders and pastors so that they can use that authority to resolve matters according to the word of God. To reconcile believers according to the word. But then he says, even if that should fail, Jesus said, let him be like a heathen and a tax gatherer. And the idea here is that a person is so hard of heart that the person refuses to submit to the word of God. That's the idea. That the, you know, the elders or pastors would, would say, hey, here's the word of God. And the person says, I refuse to submit to the word of God. Then what he says is that they need to be removed from the covering and blessing of the church. There's a covering. And in fact, interestingly, Jesus in the next few verses says, beginning in verse 18, that heaven will stand behind that decision. Notice what he says in verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That verse is often taken out of context. You see it in its context, it makes a lot of sense. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. And so here he's giving this very important insight for us. 
heaven stands behind that decision. But again, we step back and understand the whole point is restoring and re reconciliation. That's the whole purpose. Now, we've been going as a church for more than 21 years. And over the course of those 21 years, we have rarely, rarely, rarely ever had to do something like that. But I remember a particular case. This is way back in the early 90s. You don't know any of these people. And uh, way back in the early 90s, we had this, this man and his wife who were just determined to be talebearers, gossipers, we might say. They seemed to want to gather any uh, dirty information or, you know, uh, kind of uh, whatever, you know what I'm saying, and just begin to just tell others about other people. And it was like the, the, they had this kind of this juicy mentality of, did you know about this, and did you know about this, and guess what I heard about this, and, and the people would start to call me. I said, Pastor, you need to be aware. And I said, well, thank you, I appreciate that. And then somebody else would call me, Pastor, I think you need to be aware we may have an issue here. And then somebody else would call me, and somebody else would call me, I think we've got an issue here. I'm a little slow, but I get there eventually. <laughs> and uh, so... I began to look into it and ask questions and say, well, really? Did... And I began to just understand the picture. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to their house and, and talk to them. So I went to their house and I said, hey, I'm hearing some things. I want to know if it's so. I said, did, did you say this and that? And do, did you take this person's and say that and do this? He said, absolutely, I did. Oh, really? But that's not what God's Word says. You're not supposed to be doing that. That's a tail bearer. You're a gossiper. You're spreading things about other people that are not edifying at all. You've got to stop doing that, man. And it was very destructive what he was doing. <laughs> they wanted to be greeters at the church, too. Oh, wait a minute. Now, wait, 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 wait. I'm not sure that's the best place for you, okay? <laughs> but I'm in the living room, and I said, hey, what's, is this really going on? Said, yeah, it is. I said, but that's not God's word. You've got to stop. I'm asking you, would you stop? It's sin. You need to stop. I'll never forget his response. This is America. This is America. You know, I, I can say what I want to say. I said, well, you know, it is America. I give you that. But this is God's church. And God's word guides us here. And I've got to ask you to stop. I, I'm here to tell you today that sin's going to leave the camp this way. I'm asking you, will you leave your sin? Would you separate yourself from that sin? Because sin is leaving the camp. I like you to sin only to leave the camp. I like you to stay in the camp. I like you to be in. Would you stop? He said, no, I'm not going to stop. I said, really? Is that your final answer? Yeah. I said, okay. All right. And I got up out of my chair, and I stood in the living room, and I said, I want you to look at me. And I'm standing up in his living room. And I put my hands up like this. And I said, I want you to see what I'm doing. I want you to have this picture in your mind. Because the moment that you decide to leave that sin, you are welcome. I want you to see my open arms to you. Because I will receive you the moment that you understand that that's something that God wants you to let go of. And you come back. But you can't keep hurting our people. You've got to come with that understanding. See, isn't that the point? Isn't that what God wants? That we have the heart of reconciliation. You know, there was an interesting case that Paul wrote about in the book of 1 Corinthians. And there was a fellow, very hard of heart, and so this is what he says of him, 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. There's the point, isn't it? The reconciliation even to the Lord. Because the guy won't submit even to the word of God. And that hard heart, Paul recognizes and he says, you know, he's got to be delivered for the destruction of his flesh by Satan. But interestingly, in 2 Corinthians, the very next book, the letter he wrote next to them, speaks about the case again. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, Paul writes, Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary you should forgive and comfort him. Otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. I love that. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Now, continuing back to Matthew 18, 
it continues on in verse 21 with Peter asking a follow-on question, which is very interesting because it introduces a wonderful application of Jesus' point. Peter then came and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, Jesus said to him, verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That's 490 times. Now, this is important to understand a bit of the culture. In those days and times, the rabbis were teaching, the Jewish rabbis were teaching, that you were obligated to forgive only three times. They had a three strikes and you're out policy in those days. That's what the rabbis were constantly teaching. And so Peter, I think, took the idea of Jesus saying, hey, he who is greatest in the kingdom will humble himself. And I think Jesus is, or excuse me, Peter is seizing upon that. Let me demonstrate to you how great I have understood your idea of greatness. You know how the rabbis say three strikes and you're out? Hey, what do you think of this idea, Lord? Shall I forgive up to seven times? I'll take the three, multiply it times two, and add 50%. And isn't that magnanimous of me? What do you think of this, Lord? I'm, I'm saying, hey, what do you think of this? I, I say we should forgive our brother up to seven times. I mean, isn't that a magnanimous number? That is, multiply times two, add 50%, seven times. Magnanimous, marvelous. And I think he was expecting Jesus to say, well done, my son. Peter, you are magnanimous. But Jesus says to him, Peter, no. I'm not saying seven times. I'm saying to you, 70 times seven. <laughs> I could just imagine Peter's face. <laughs> what? Did, did, did you say 70 times seven? That's 490. 490? Here's the point. Forgive. He's talking about greatness. He who wants to be great, forgive and stop counting offenses. That's the whole point. The whole point is not that you're going to sit there and count. The point is you're not going to count. Stop counting offenses. And what is he saying? He's really saying, hey, become a forgiving person by nature. Let it be who you are. Want to be great in the kingdom of God? Let it be who you are. He's not saying to Peter, hey, here's the thing, you can keep track. And when you keep track and you get to 491, then you can become bitter and unforgiving. He's not saying that. I'm sure that there are some people who think that. Oh yeah, you don't know my husband. He can get to 490 really fast. <laughs> In fact, I thought of a great app. You know, uh, an app for a smartphone? This, I think, could sell a bunch. We have an app for a smartphone that keeps track of other people's offenses so that you know when you got 490 all filled in. Then you can become bitter and unforgiving. I've reached it with you, pal. My smartphone tells me you've got 491. <laughs> no. The point is that you don't keep track. If you could summarize each of the disciples with one word, what do you think, or one phrase, what do you think it'd be? John. Uh, John is known as the beloved. That's his rep. The beloved. The one that Jesus loved. Uh, Thomas. Doubter. You could know, you, we summarize by doubter. Uh, Peter. Oh, Peter, yeah. Uh, the one with the foot-shaped mouth. Oh, yeah, we know Peter. <laughs> but how about you? If you were to be known by one word or just one phrase, what would it be? Wouldn't it be marvelous if someone knew you and said, Oh, I know so-and-so. Oh yeah, he, he's a forgiving, gracious person. Oh, I know, I know her. Oh yes, you need to know her. She is a forgiving, gracious person.
person. Wouldn't that be marvelous? You were known by it. And this is, I think, what Jesus is saying here. That it becomes part of who you are. It's your nature. You want to become great in the kingdom, he says? Let me tell you something. Don't keep track of your forgiveness. I remember reading a story about this young pastor who began serving in this small town to go to this new ministry. And he's trying to get to know people in town. And he finds this older woman, old woman, who is an old maid. But she's bitter. Very bitter. And he takes note of the, um, the degree of bitterness. Oh. Begins to ask, what happened? Well, they knew the story. They said, oh, she was young and in love. She was engaged to be married. Her fiancé ran off with her best friend. And she was hurt, crushed, and angry. And she was bitter. And she couldn't let go. And now you see her as she is. And the pastor began to realize what had happened. She chose to be bitter, and she chose to be bitter, and she chose to be bitter until she didn't have to choose it anymore. She simply became bitter. You see the point? She chose bitter, she chose bitter, and she chose bitter until she didn't have to choose it anymore. It simply became who she was. A bitter old maid who never knew love again. Now, I'm convinced that the opposite can also be true. That a person can forgive and forgive and forgive. You can choose to forgive and choose to forgive and choose to forgive and choose to forgive so that you don't have to choose it anymore. It's simply who you are. In other words, to become a forgiving person is to forgive so many times that you lose count. And it's connected to love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 and 7, those great verses on love, it can be summarized, those two verses says this, love does not take account a wrong suffered, does not keep account of a wrong suffered. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Here's the thing. We are all imperfect. This is the truth. We are all imperfect. We live in an imperfect world, and we're all going to keep doing imperfect things. Is this not true? And therefore, if you don't have a spirit of forgiveness, you're not going to have very many relationships in this world because you're living in a world filled with imperfect people. And even we learn how to forgive, or we're going to have a very sad existence. And isn't that what Jesus is trying to explain to us? You want to be great in the kingdom? And I would even say, if you're married, marriage requires forgiveness. It's a, it's a requirement. You need to be a master of forgiveness if you're going to be happily married. And all the married people said, Amen. This is absolutely so. This is what we say to the young people, you know, when we do marriage, pre-marriage counseling? We're, we're preparing them for marriage. So we're here, we're meeting with a young couple. Let me prepare you for marriage. I can summarize the key to your success with one word. That one word is forgiveness. You want to be happy in your marriage? Forgive. You want to be unhappy in your marriage? Don't forget. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that great? Love covers a multitude of sins, which is to say a lack of love exposes sins or faults. It's like fault-finding. Fault Focusing on every problem. Do you know what I don't like about my husband? Everything. He squeezes the toothpaste wrong. I don't like the way he talks. I don't like the way he eats. 
I don't like the way he sits there on the couch with his hand like this. I don't like, he, he bothers me. That's fault finding. But love covers a multitude of sin. Forgiveness is not a number. Forgiveness is a condition. Forgiveness is a nature that God wants you to have. You want to be great? This is what he says. It's powerful. And I want to maybe summarize and put it practically in this sense. Let go of grudges of the past. Many people carry grudge, hold on to grudges. And I thought I could maybe illustrate it by using something to hold on to. Many people, they'll hold on. It feels good to have something when you're offended to hold on to. And I think what the scripture tells us is very clear. Let go. Stop holding on. And we all understand what it means to burn with something when, you, when you've been offended and you want to hold on to it because it feels so right to hold on to it. I remember when I was young, I just got my driver's license and had a little job, you know, so I had a bit of money and I, for the very first time, went to McDonald's to get something for myself, you know, I'm just a kid, right? And I go through the drive through you know, and I drive, um, I don't know, a few blocks away and I look in my bag and I realize, hey, they forgot my apple pie. And I don't know what happened to me. I start, I, I'm serious, I, I started burning. They forgot my apple pie. And I, I, I whipped that car around, boy. I went up to the, and I went right into the counter and I said, excuse me, you forgot my apple pie. <laughs> they said, we are so sorry. Here, we'll give you that one and even another one. Don't be nice to me. <laughs> I want to be mad. I want to hold on to it. You're not letting me hold on to it. Stop being nice to me. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I remember, I mean, we we'll all understand what it means to burn. I, I'm much older now, in fact. I'm a pastor. And <laughs> I, was, I was at the beach, and I was coming back, I was by myself, and uh, you know how it is when you're leaving town at the beach there, and the, you've got two lanes, and they're merging into one. It's all busy because everyone's leaving town. And so it's all real slow. And the way it works when two lanes merge into one lane, the way it works is that we take turns. That's the way it works. Only thing is the guy next to me apparently didn't get that memo. So it was his turn, this guy's turn, then my turn, then that guy's turn. So that guy went and I moved up because it was my turn. And then the guy moved up as to cut me off. That's strange. It's my turn. So I moved up a little bit more, which is to say to him, hey, it's my turn. Did you get that, Mama? <laughs> and he moved up even more, which is to say, hey, I got the Mama, and I really don't care. <laughs> and something started to burn in my heart. Now, I'm a pastor. I should know better. I'm admitting it, okay? So I turned, you know, of course I backed up, I had no choice, and I got behind him, and then I could see the back of his head. <laughs> Burning lasers. And then I saw his wife right next to him, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh yeah, you go girl, you get him. <laughs> he needs it, he needs it. And I'm driving, you know, and, I, and I'm driving along behind him, and I'm just sitting there burning, and then the Holy Spirit, what are you doing? What are you doing? Let go. Let go. One of the reasons people don't want to let go of a grudge or offense or a hurt of the past is that they can't stand the thought that the person is going to get away with it. Justice. It's not right. You've got to pay. But here's where faith comes in. Faith trusts that God is the one who makes justice. God makes justice. 
You've got to trust God. Secondly, Jesus said, hey, you let it go. You cast your cares. You give them to the Lord. It's not, when you let them go, it's just that you're not just giving them up to the, uh, the sky. You give them over to the Lord. You give that to me. You cast that to, you give that to me. Let go of it. Let go of it. You give that to me. See, here's a great scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You want to be great in the kingdom? How about Leviticus 19.18? Don't seek revenge. Don't bear a grudge against any of your people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus even defined what that was in an amazing way. I am the Lord. That's why you do it. I am the Lord. It's the direction that the Lord is giving for your own good, for the blessing. Hey, if you would live these three words out, you're going to get a blessing. Another one of the ways you can let go is by remembering how much you've also been forgiven. Notice what it says next. Verse 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. Now that's a lot. That is so much. That was calculated out by somebody that is like 150,000 years of labor. The whole point is you're not paying that back. That is so huge an amount, it is impossible to pay back. So when he brought him, there was one who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had until repayment was made. That was common in the day. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him and said, Have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him only a hundred denarii, a mere pittance in comparison. But he seized him by the throat, took hold of him by the neck, and began to choke him. And you pay back what you owe. And the fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me, I'll repay you. But he was unwilling to do it. He went and threw him in prison until he should repay what was owed. But when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were grieved. And they came and reported it to the Lord. They knew, hey, that's not right. That's not right. This guy had been forgiven so much and he couldn't forgive a little thing. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, you wicked slave, I forgave you all of that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger and handed him over to the tormentors until he should repay all that was owed. So shall my father be. It's interesting, isn't it? Tormentors, that word tormentors. If a prison does not forgive, I'm convinced that he will be tormented. Unforgiveness is a torment all unto itself. I mean, there there are medical studies done today that relate to that. But Jesus is speaking here a powerful word. Ephesians 4 2. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's the point. You look at how others have offended, but you compare that to the forgiveness of all that you've ever done and realize, I need to forgive because of how much I have been forgiven. Amen? That's a great reason. And then Hebrews 12.15 says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, for by it many are defiled.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. So powerful, so insightful, so helpful for us to understand the transformation that you want to do. Lord, we this morning say we want to be increased. We want to understand what it means to be great in the kingdom, and you've shown that to us so clearly. God, help us to be people who forgive by nature, because you've changed our nature. You've changed who we are by your Holy Spirit. Change us this morning. Lord, move by your Spirit now upon us. Church, as we are praying this morning, as we are before the Lord, I'm asking this question. Is there anyone here this morning who would say, there's some things in my life I need to let go of. I need to let go. I need to forgive. I'm going to give them over and entrust them to the Lord that I may be free. Is that you? Would you ask the Lord to be free this morning? Just raise your hand to the Lord. Say, Lord, I need to be free. I'm going to hand these things over. I'm going to place them in your care. Set me free, oh God. God bless everyone with that heart, that request, that desire. Father, you know our heart. You desire to move in our lives. So we honor you and thank you for the powerful Holy Spirit moving in us now. In Jesus' name. And everyone said...